We rolling? We are rolling. Camera one. Camera one. Camera two. Rolling. Here, we'll be smoking the Dos Caras. Is that how to say that right? Caras? Dos Caras. I'm guessing. I'm a white ass Idahoan. Uh, this was gifted to us from the job that we've been doing with a company called the Augusta Rule. We were told that these were basically straight out of the shop that uh, one of the guys was purchasing from. They're from the shop itself. It's not a nationally or internationally distributed uh, brand of cigars, as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. He searched it on Google. And he couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. This is probably going to be the last video you see from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. um, what a way to start. <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> I, I am not someone... I have political opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, I've really, I've thought through these things, I've discussed these things, I have friends who I like talking about those things with, but I don't like pushing those things. I like having ideas, but to be making a documentary that is about the political conversion uh, of a Twitch streamer or YouTuber, it's not the kind of content that I really wanted to make. But I found myself in a situation where I had discovered her, I was so like blown away by who she was, um, through her YouTube videos and the further and further I got into this project it just has felt like sort of the unavoidable aspects of talking about political things it's just inevitable with this stuff but I didn't want to I still don't want to have that be the thing that I make my life about but I had to make this story I had to tell this I had to do this documentary mm -hmm. and I've had many awkward conversations with friends who are on the other side of the polit political spectrum when they ask me what I'm doing for mm -hmm. my work and they ask like oh what's like a big project you're working on what's the main thing you're working on right now and like that's been the case for two and a half years has been a feature-length documentary oh what's it about mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just terribly terribly awkward conversations where like i don't want to get into this right now i want you to be my friend first i don't want to talk about that stuff because i honestly i think that that's that's what our society needs is people capable of loving each other now, I personally believe that the only way that that's really gotten that in a meaningful way is through Jesus Christ. That's my perspective on it. Somebody has to be practicing it. What role does faith, even if it's just faith on display, what role mm -hmm. does that play in media, in art? My perspective on faith in the creation of art, you have to believe in something. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people out there, amazing artists, who don't believe in God, or at least don't believe in... Yahweh, but they believe in some kind of construct, whether they admit it or not. They believe in a system of beauty, a belief of something that is good. That belief, it leads them to have, to basically having a standard about what the thing that they're making. And that generally ends up creating beautiful things. And it, maybe it's slightly altered from this artist and slightly altered from mm -hmm. this artist. They're always like a little different, but it's amazing how different artists who have completely different styles and standards mm -hmm for beauty can look at each other's work and say that guy's stuff is beautiful, mm -hmm. that guy's stuff is beautiful. You can have like these little alterations because there's sort of multiple ways to get at it. They have to chase after the thing they think is beautiful and you have to have a theory. Why right away, it's very good. It is really good, yeah. Looks like it might be sun-grown as opposed to Connecticut. It's a little darker than Connecticut. You can always tell when it's sun-grown by the canoeing. <laughs> that's right, we've been dealing with that. Recently that's yeah. been the case, but that's, yeah. <laughs> That's not actually the cigar's mm -hmm. fault. Beauty has been very closely tied to dynamic. Highs and lows, peaks and valleys. How many different categories of art can you apply the concept of dynamic? There's the lines in your frame. There's shadows and shadows highlights. And highlights. Mm -hmm. There's your color range that you have in your mm -hmm. frame. White space, spaces with something, spaces with nothing. It's dynamic going on there. Mm -hmm. In music, dynamic can be applied to volume. How quiet or loud, what rhythm did I play here as opposed to what rhythm did I play here? You can have dynamic in your lyrics. You can have dynamic in the way that you play the guitar. You can play it clean, you can play it heavy, you can play both of them at the same time. You can have a doubled guitar part. One's filling this space and one is filling this other space. Mm -hmm. It feels like beauty is very closely tied to an appropriate use of dynamic. Flat images that have no contrast, no interest, there's a million different things that's gonna get your focus on it. Like it's too full. Right. Uh, you have nothing to focus on because you have too much to focus on. That's one of the things I hate about psychedelic art. 
a lot of that art style. It's just all the colors at once. Yeah. Kind of just uh, this vomit of color. Whereas you look at something where the artist was restrained in their colors that they used. Maybe they just used three colors. There's sort of a beauty that can be found in the limiting, the very clear order, rather than just throwing everything at the paper or the canvas to have that negative space. When you get just good enough that you can fill the frame or you can fill the composition with, well, I, can, I can write an amazing guitar part and I can write an amazing piano part and mm -hmm. I can write an amazing drum part and let's just put all of them in there at the same time because they're all amazing. You've just cluttered everything up. The most amazing drum part with a great riff oftentimes is more reserved. Reserved in how much space it's taking up. Maybe it's not reserved in the way that it's played. I think about the same thing with like camera movement. You don't want to have the same camera movement over and over and over again. You need changes. You need still shots. You need mm -hmm. stable locked off shots. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the place that I've probably gone the most in regards to my own theory of beauty is just the concept of dynamic. There is an objective reality to beauty, but there is a subjective way in which you perceive it. You and I, we cannot have the same perception. We might still get a pretty close sense of the same thing. If we both have somewhat accurate views on the objective reality, then hopefully our mm -hmm. synthesis of our ideas somehow can be justified to that reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another interesting thing about the subjective perception of things is that you can come to certain conclusions that are basically the exact same conclusions that I've come to through mm -hmm. your experience of life, but you've come to ones that I, I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. or not as a for on the forefront or maybe one that I know intuitively, but I, I'm not thinking about. And then because I'm not thinking about it, I'm not applying it. We, we ran into this in the, the shoot that we were just on. When we're going over this article about camera heights and how it affects the way that you see someone, it's all stuff that I knew, but I wasn't thinking about it. And you said something that I already agreed with, and it's like, okay, I needed to hear that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Let's do it. With the documentary, when I had a conversation with John and Kenny about the nature of the first cut of the doc and how not good it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't see its flaws. I saw some flaws. I saw plenty mm -hmm. of flaws, but I didn't see the flaws that they saw. And then they said them, and then it was just like you know, removing the veil, or it was like turning my head mm -hmm. over at the, the flaws that they saw. I had to basically start over on that thing. They saw something that at the time I didn't see, but when they brought my attention to it, I was like, yes, mm -hmm. you are so, it immediately spoke to my convictions with the way that I thought about story and I just couldn't see it because I was too close looking at other elements. It's interesting in that moment because you're stuck with this dilemma. You have kind of two options. One is either uh, get really, really angry <laughs> and deny it mm -hmm. uh, and then just defend and justify yeah. your own decisions. Yeah. And then the other option is to actually acknowledge the truth of what has been said. Mm -hmm. And then in, in the documentary case, it yeah. was like, all right, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do <laughs> so much more work now. <laughs> yes. I'm so glad that I had that conversation with them because the, the documentary would not be what it is today if it was not for that conversation.